What, what a beautiful morning. I just love that. How wonderful to see what God's doing in and through that family. Hey, um, I'm so moved by the theme of children this morning. I want to do two things. I want to give a greeting to everybody who's watching online. And in particular, I want to give a greeting to one special person that's watching online. That's my son, Nathan, who's watching from a hospital bed in Israel. And I, I don't want to get over dramatic. His life's not in danger. He was injured while he was over there for a few months. And it's just been kind of a long stay in the hospital. And um, he's tuning in right now. Could I ask you guys to pray for him right now? So just reach a hand forward in faith as you're praying for Nathan. And uh, Father in heaven, we lift up my dear son, Nathan. We pray, Lord, that you would just bless and strengthen and cover him. And Lord, speed his healing. Do it miraculously, Lord. Uh, Thank you that you've been with him every day, every hour through his time in the hospital. Lord, complete it now and finish it in power and your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Nathan is probably going to really give me the business for doing this later on. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. I have something to share with you this morning that's really, I believe, very simple. But I want you to know I regard it as being very profound. And it's going to be found in Psalm 68. Listen carefully as I read the text uh, here before you this morning. Now, we're not going to cover all of the psalm, only about half of it here together, but I think the theme really speaks to what Pastor Casey was talking to us about here this morning. So, Psalm 68, verse 1 through 3. Ready? Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. When under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David, King David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, when he opened up Psalm 68 with those words, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered, he's referencing back to something that was famous in Israel's history. Just like if I were to stand before you, and maybe not everybody in this room is going to get this, but I suppose most of the people in the room will. If I were to stand before you this morning and say, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers, you'd instantly make a connection, wouldn't you? You'd say, well, he's quoting from Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address. You'd take those words, that opening, and connect it to something profound in our history. That's exactly what David did here. What David did was connect these words with something very profound in God's history because what he's doing is he's quoting from a passage in the book of Numbers, chapter 10, that has to do with the great deliverance that God won for his people when he brought them out of Egypt and started them on the journey to the promised land. When they broke camp and started on their way, these were the words that were sung. These were the words that were spoken Let God arise and let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. That's Numbers chapter 10, verse 35. What David is doing is he's saying this, is God's power and victory were real in the lives of his people generations ago. His power and his victory is real in the life of his people today. That's a simple idea. It's a simple idea that just simply says that God, go before us and take care of our enemies. By the way, don't you need that this week? Now, aren't you opposed on many fronts? Don't you have difficult people, difficult circumstances? And I'll say what's even greater than that. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual enemies that threaten us on every side. We need the Lord to rise up on our behalf and pray that our enemies, the enemies of God, would be scattered. So much so, notice here in verse two, it says, as smoke is driven away, 
so drive them away. God's enemies have no ability to send from him. You know this, don't you? That if God were to rise up in full strength on your behalf, absolutely nothing could stand in front of him. That the victory would be complete and the victory would be won. You understand that. Now, this is what I want you to gather. This great power of God was expressed back in the days of the Exodus. By the way, it was a tremendous power of God, don't you think? Don't you think it was a tremendous power of God that sent all of those plagues upon Egypt? Did you know that when God sent the plagues upon Egypt, and you can read all about this in the book of Exodus, and, and if you, you should be reading the book of Exodus, but if you want to get the Cliff Notes version, what version, what, what, watch the, the Ten Commandments of Charlton Heston. You'll see how when God raised up on behalf of Israel, and when he scattered, he scattered the Egyptian gods. For example, the Egyptians worshipped a god that was the embodiment of the Nile River. So what did God do? He turned the Nile to blood. It was in the face of that idol. The Egyptians worshipped a god that basically had a frog's head. And you know what God said? God said, you're into frogs? I'll give you frogs. I'll give you frogs everywhere. And frogs became a curse to them. Instead of blessing, And on and on through every plague. Every plague was a way that God flexed his muscles on behalf of his people and scattered his enemies. But you know, that power of God did not end during the days of the Exodus. Let me tell you something else where it was example. Don't you know that the power of God was living and active during the days of Jesus' ministry on earth? Was there anything more exciting than that? Is there anything more exciting than seeing Jesus stand up in the midst of the storm on the Sea of Galilee and just pronounce that word of peace, peace be still, and he has authority over the wind and the waves? Is there anything more majestic than Jesus' power over every foul demonic spirit? Jesus' power over every sickness that would come his way. Jesus' power over sin and death itself in his resurrection. It's all shown there. I'm just here to tell you, and I think we can gather this from the first few verses. We serve a God of mighty power and strength. Do you believe that here this morning? All right, hold that in your mind. You, you, you holding that tight in your mind? Now, look here. Starting at verse 4. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name Yah and rejoice before him. Okay, the proper uh, uh, response of God's people when they see how glorious, how mighty, how powerful God is. We should praise him. We should honor him. But now look at what he says, starting at verse 5. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Brothers and sisters, what we have in front of us in these verses, especially in verses five and six, is something so counterintuitive that I have to explain it to you. Here's what's counterintuitive about it. We understand, and we gathered it from the first three verses of Psalm 68. God is a God of great power and majesty. God has the the might to do whatever he pleases. Now we see in verses four, five, and six, we see that God uses that might to help humble people in humble ways. Isn't that remarkable? Did you see the words right there in verse five? A father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Now I almost wish that we could go back to the days of David when he wrote this or go back 200 years just in the history of the world and understand this in a new way because I'll tell you something we live in a world today where we can actually do something dramatic about the crisis of kids that have no home 
and, and Pastor Casey spoke about it in an eloquent way. I was so thrilled to see how many of you stood up this morning because you're doing something to help the fatherless in your community. That is a powerful and a glorious thing. But what I want you to understand is today we have the means, we have the ability, we have the communications, we have the technology to do things about it that was not available in previous centuries. There has always been a crisis of fatherless children. There's always been a crisis of the poor and disadvantaged. And even though we need the heart of God in dealing with it today the best we can, if you want to go back through history, it's been even worse in times past. And it would be easy to say, Lord, this is almost a waste of your great power. If you had all power, if you had all authority, what would you do with it? And some people say, well, I would change nations. I would establish world leaders. I I would find a cure for cancer. I would do great and bold and dramatic things. And let me tell you something, God does those great and bold and dramatic things, but never to the neglect of his care for individual, humble, hurting people. Sometimes we feel That the God of the universe has bigger things on his agenda than my simple need. I want you to know this verse, Psalm 86, where it speaks so powerfully here, or excuse me, Psalm 68, where it speaks so powerfully about him being a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. That means that God cares about you in your humble need. If there was any place where you could see this powerfully expressed, it would be in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, do you agree Jesus had power when he walked this earth? The the, the same one who could still the storm with a word? The same one who could multiply the loaves and the fishes and feed thousands? The same one who, who never backed down before a demonic encounter, but always put the demons in their place and brought freedom and deliverance and help and happiness and hope to countless thousands. Jesus Christ walked this earth full of God's power. And let me say this. The religious people of Jesus' day were looking for a God of power. They wanted a Messiah filled with power. And Jesus came on the scene and said, here I am. I am the Messiah and I have the power of God. But let me tell you what many of the religious people in Jesus' day said to themselves when they saw the power of Jesus in action. They said this, what a waste. You have all power. You are the Messiah. You can do whatever you please. And what do you do? You help a few blind and lame people. Why don't you use your power to call down fire from heaven on the Roman legions? Why don't you use your power to defeat and humiliate all our enemies and oppressors and lift us up to an exalted status? That would be a valid use of the Messiah's power. But let me tell you something. Jesus said, no, I want to show you something in my role as Messiah, that I am the God of all power, but I am going to use my power to meet the humble needs of humble people. So here's a blind man that he healed. There's a woman with an issue of blood that he healed. Here's a little girl uh, who's dead and yet he miraculously raises her from the dead. Here's people that he feeds for one lunch. Can you imagine almost anything more insignificant than one lunch? Six hours later, you're hungry again. Some of us even sooner. But Jesus said, no, it's not a waste. I'm gonna show the power of God in humble ways. Brothers and sisters, this is something we need to latch on to. Number one, to believe with all our heart 
that God is a God of power and authority, but to understand that God uses his power to come and humbly meet the needs of his humble people, including the fatherless, including, I love how he states it here in verse six, how God sets the solitary in families. You see, you know, one of the fascinating trends in our modern age is that there's more and more single people who are remaining single for a substantial period of their life. And nobody here needs to raise your hand if that's you. And I'll tell you, it's something that the church is learning how to deal with. But because, rightfully so, just like Pastor Casey said earlier today, rightfully so, we understand that God has a big role for families in his world and in his kingdom. There's no doubt about it. But, but, God also has a plan for the single person. And what does he do with them? Well, one of the things he does, he wants to do, is he sets them in family. Now, I, I, I don't know what that means to you. When you think of being set in family, do you think of, uh, well, a lot of it, well, marriage, that's what it means for me, or you're thinking uh, some other kind of arrangement, maybe somebody's going to adopt me. I'll tell you one thing that God setting the solitary in families means is it means this, it means you've got a family of God all around you here this morning, and there's not a single person here who needs to feel truly alone. God has a family all around you, and he has put the solitary in families. He, look at verse six. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. I like that last phrase, that the rebellious dwell in a dry land, because it tells me that God's not going to force this upon anybody. God has blessing. God has help. God has family for you but he's not gonna force it upon you. If you choose to be rebellious against him, you're gonna distance yourself from that wonderful blessing, that wonderful grace that God has for you. That power, brothers and sisters, the power that set the universe in motion. Pretty big power, don't you think? That power is extended towards you and your humble need. When I think about that in big terms, I can hardly get my head around it. Don't you sometimes think that maybe God should have not enough time for me, for you, enough care and concern? But I want you to know, this is the glory of God. That he takes his great power, his great authority, and he reaches out and he looks for the lowly, he looks for the oppressed, he looks for the disadvantaged, he looks for the one who who is set in a terrible place, and he says, here, I offer you my love, my help, my grace, but you need to receive it. I'll read that verse to you again. It says right there, it says, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Now look, God is into this great deliverance. Let me read you some more verses from Psalm 68. It says here at verse 10, O God, when you went out from before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, Selah, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O God, sent a plentiful rain, whereby you confirmed your inheritance when it was weary. Your congregation dwelt in it. You, O oh God, provided from your goodness for the poor. Do you see that? The same God who shook the earth. I come from California. You on Florida, you don't know about earthquakes. I know about earthquakes. There is something profoundly humbling about an earthquake. When the earthquakes and you feel things shaking, and the very ground under your feet that you thought was so stable is now uh, uh, seeming to be turning like liquid underneath you, there's something very humble. There's something that says, there's someone much greater than even the ground I stand upon. The same God who shakes the earth cares about your individual need. Now, if you doubt this, I want you to think back to a prayer 
that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Remember that? Sometimes we call it the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. What's one of the lines in that prayer? He says this, give us this day our daily bread. He cares about you, your individual needs, the same God that shakes the earth. And then continue on. I like this, and really we'll, we'll leave these last few verses for our consideration here. Verses 11 through 14, he says this. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Kings of armies flee, they flee. And she who remains at home divides the spoil. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Zalman. Look at that closely there. Verses 11 and 12. It's again emphasizing the idea of the Lord's might. The Lord appears on the scene and he's mighty. The earth shakes. He proclaims his word. The battle's won. Verse 12. Kings of armies flee and she who remains at home divides the spoil. Okay, I want you to think about this. Verse 12. Kings of armies flee. Doesn't that tell us that the Lord won the victory and every king that opposed them, they're running for their lives? Kings of armies flee and who gets a share in the spoil? Look at it there in verse 12. Who gets a share of the spoil? She who remains at home. Now wait a minute here. There's just something I don't understand about that. She who remains at home did not fight in the battle, did she? No, she stayed at home. Matter of fact, under normal circumstances in Israel, she she wouldn't even be allowed in the army of ancient Israel because she's a woman and, and they wanted their women home, protecting the home while the men go out and fight. She who remains at home was someone who did not fight, yet she gets a share in the spoil. Brothers and sisters, I'm happy to proclaim that that's you and I. It really is. That's you, that's me. What do I mean by that? We share in the spoil of a battle we never fought. That's the whole message of the gospel. Do you understand that? That when Jesus Christ went to the cross and purchased our redemption, when he defeated every principality and power by his mighty work at the cross, when he became everything in our place, all our sin, all our guilt, all our dishonor, all our shame was poured out upon him, when all of that happened, he triumphed over all of it. Sometimes we think that Jesus just bore the sin of the world, and he did bear it. Sometimes we think that Jesus just bore our guilt and shame, and he did bear it, but he did more than bear it. He triumphed over it. He won a victory over it. You know what he says to you and I and all who will believe all who will not rebel against him. He says, you come share in the spoil of a battle that I won and you didn't fight. That is the gospel invitation, brothers and sisters. It really is. God invites you to share in the spoil of a battle that you never fought. And he does it because he takes his great power, his great majesty, and he stoops down low to give it to the weak, the helpless, the oppressed, the poor. Let me wrap this up by giving very two practical points of application. The first thing you need to do is realize that you need to receive what God is giving. You know, on a day like this, Orphan Sunday, we think about the fatherless, we think about this. Oftentimes, we're stirred with compassion and we kind of say this, we go, man, those people really need something from God. God, I hope you bring it to them. And it's true. Do they need something from God? Absolutely. And pray for the fatherless. Pray for the orphans. Pray for the, the widow. Pray for those who are weak and oppressed and disadvantaged. But, You know what Jesus wants you to know and see? That you are in the same place spiritually. 
Didn't Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he open it up by saying this? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Brothers and sisters, that has to be us. You have to realize that you need to come to God in the same way that an orphan would come to an adoptive father. You need to come before God the same way that an utterly bankrupt person might come to someone who could help them out financially. You need to come before God the way that an utterly guilty person in a court of law might come to a lawyer who could rescue them. We come in terms of complete humility, acknowledging our weakness and saying, Lord, I need you. And I need you like a starving man needs food, like a drowning man needs a rescue, like an orphan needs a parent. Brothers and sisters, if you think it's them who have this great need and not we who have this great need, you who has this great need, you will always be on the outside looking in. The first thing you must do is receive the tender love and care and victory of Jesus that he gives to the weak, the poor, the disadvantaged. That's the first thing. Second practical point, having received it, now you need to live that out. I would imagine that somebody could look at Psalm 68 in a wrong way and say something like this. Lord, you're the father to the fatherless. That's what it says there in that psalm, doesn't it? You're the father to the fatherless. Now I don't have to be. You'll take care of them. I want you to know that that is never the heart of God in the scriptures. God does not say, I love and care for the orphan. You don't have to worry about them. God does not say, I love and care for the oppressed. You don't have to worry about them. God does not say, I love and care for the person who's trapped in sin. You don't have to care about them. No, God says, you need to care about them because I care about them. If you are going to follow me, the Lord says, you need to care about the things I care about. You need to bleed for the things I bled for. You need to give to the things I sacrificed for. You need to love and reach out to the people that I reach out to. Now in some ways, I feel like when I say this to this congregation, I'm preaching to the choir. Because I was amazed at how many people stood and you are actively caring for the fatherless, for the disadvantaged, for those who have a bad place in life. That's a beautiful thing, but listen. There's not a single person here who doesn't need to hear that when you do that, you are fulfilling the heart of God, number one, and number two, you need to do it more and more because God is that kind of God. It begins with our receiving as humble receivers from God and it continues by saying, Lord, now that we have received, we want to love the way you love. You are a father to the fatherless. You care for the widow. You care for the orphan. Now help us to do the same. Father in heaven, I pray that you, the God of all strength, who stooped down in this mighty and remarkable way, when it would seem like you had far greater things to care about or act upon, Lord, you came after us. You came after me. You, you reach out to the fatherless, to the weak, to the poor, to the oppressed, to the hurting. To the poor in spirit. To those that mourn. Lord, I pray that you would instill that humility into every one of our hearts and that we would receive and reflect this great love and power of God on behalf of the needy among us and in our community. We pray this in Jesus' name, Lord. 
amen. Can we thank David one more time? I had to reach over to my wife and I say, you see why I love this guy? I mean, that's the gospel that we cling to. So I'd like to invite our prayer partners to come and um, as we normally do, we're going to have uh, some moments of prayer here. So if you're one of our prayer partners, would you come forward? And I'd like to invite you, um, if you've never met this God who cares for the widow, who cares for the orphan, and who cares for the, the broken, those who find themselves in the cul-de-sac of sin and self, no matter what name you put to it, call it addiction, call it abuse, call it lack of significance, whatever you might find yourself suffering from. Just want to invite you to come and, and meet a God who, like David says, loves to use his power to meet the humble and give them life right where they are. If you know that God and you've maybe been encouraged today or convicted today, maybe you, you want prayer uh, to ask for that same God to empower you to take that next step toward those around you with that same grace. We believe that the ministry of prayer actually moves heaven and earth to give you things that you can't have without it. So whether you're meeting that God for the first time or you're meeting that God for the 50th time, we're going to have some people down here who want to pray God's spirit and God's favor into you and over you. Let them know where you are. You'll hear the music behind us. I'm going to dismiss this in a benediction, but this moment will be open for a while love to invite you into it. So would you now all stand and receive God's promise. I'd love to give a benediction uh, and invite you to uh, put your hands out because a benediction is not just a, a prayer. It's a promise for God's people and, and this is a receiving posture. And um, If you're comfortable, go ahead and, and turn your hands over like this and I'll pronounce a benediction over you uh, that it might be true more and more for you and we'll dismiss. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Father to the fatherless keep you. May those who place the lonely in families make his face to shine upon you and give you peace so that you might receive it and go and do the same. Amen and amen. Love you guys. See you next week.